today, the 14th of October, uh, 2020. Uh, very welcome once again to uh, our webinar. I, I believe many of you have been attending uh, the other events and webinars that we have been running over the course of the last um, three to four months. And, and I trust that you have found them um, educative, and informative, and, and that they've helped you uh, in your various tasks um, uh, wherever you work. Uh, this morning, we are very excited uh, to have a session focusing on public finance management. And uh, in a, a few minutes, I'll be introducing uh, our, 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 our speaker um, um, who, who, who will certainly do a lot of justice to the topic. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic certainly presents one of the largest challenges to, to government um, uh, in Uganda and, and across the world. And, and as a result of this pandemic, um, a number of governments have uh, implemented various fiscal interventions. Um, and, and this, the effect of the pandemic and all of these, of, of these interventions uh, will certainly be felt uh, in the short term, but also in, in the long term. And the unparalleled nature of these fiscal measures uh, uh, implemented to, to manage the, the pandemic uh, calls for strong PFM, strong public finance management, and, and calls for us to be able to maximize uh, resource uh, uh, utilization uh, to ensure that um, we uh, achieve effective uh, outcomes. So strong public oversight and accountability for these resources is certainly called for, and, and this demands for high quality financial reporting, which will be essential for us to achieve the overall impact of, of these uh, finances. So within this webinar, we will uh, uh, receive insights on how public sector entities can uh, uh, prepare and strengthen their capacity to, to manage uh, PFM systems uh, in unprecedented times. The, the topic that we have for discussion this morning is public finance management challenges for accountants in fiscal year 2020, uh, 2021, and, and the way forward. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased and honored um, to uh, present to you our speaker this morning, who is none other than uh, CPA Lawrence Semakula, uh, the Accountant General of the Republic of Uganda. We are very honored to have uh, CPA Semakula with us this morning. Um, Lawrence joined the Ministry of Finance in 2001 as uh, Assistant Commissioner Accounts in charge of foreign funds. And and in 2002, he became the acting commissioner, treasury officer of accounts. And, uh, and this position was later uh, redesignated to commissioner accounts in 2005, uh, and they newly created Department of Financial Management Services. Uh, Lawrence became acting accountant general in 2013 and was confirmed into this position in 2014. Prior to joining government, uh, Lawrence worked with uh, Nile Hotel International for a period of 11 years, where he was financial accountant in 1990, uh, all the way to uh, chief accountant and finance controller in 1995. Uh, Lawrence became a member and fellow of the SCCA, uh, where he's been for 15 years. He's also a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda. He holds an MBA from Harriet Watts University and a Bachelor of Commerce uh, degree uh, accounting from uh, Macquarie University. He has undertaken specialized training in various areas, including uh, debt management with Harvard University, uh, public expenditure management and public policy management with the Joint Africa Institute uh, Strategy Policy Planning uh, uh, from the International Center for parliamentary studies in the UK, he holds various other certificates in public financial management. Uh, CPS Makula is associated with various PFM reforms, initiatives in, in, in government, 
he chaired the uh, implementation work group under IFMS, where he was uh, the task chair on implementation of EFT, and task chair on treasury single account and salary decentralization. Uh, in 2012, he was directly charged with the responsibility of reviewing PFM systems with the aim of strengthening controls and addressing any emerging weaknesses highlighted by uh, reviews from various oversight bodies and development partners. And, and, and certainly Lawrence has spoken to us uh, various times before, um, uh, but also he has spoken at various international and regional fora. Uh, and, and as a result of all of this detailed work, he has received various accolades. And, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, um, it, it, we, we certainly could not have anyone better to speak to us today on the subject of PFM, uh, other than uh, CPA Lawrence Samakula, the Accountant General of Uganda. Uh, CPA uh, Lawrence Samakula, you're very welcome to speak to our participants. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark, for those uh, good words. I hope I'll, uh, I'll meet your expectation. It's always an honor to me to, to speak on such gatherings about uh, public finance management, which is an area that is definitely very dear to me. Uh, of course, uh, this time we are, we are meeting in very fierce circumstances, but these are the circumstances that have become the norm, and therefore we should embrace them and be able to, to see how best we can uh, move forward under these circumstances. So I thank ICPU definitely for always inviting me and other professional bodies or to talk about areas of public finance management. Of course, without wasting much time, I hope everybody can see my presentation on the screen. Uh, uh, please let me know if there's an issue and I, I see how best to sort it out. But, um, This is uh, the presentation structure. Uh, I'll do the introduction. I'll talk basically about accounting in the public sector. And I'll talk about challenges for the accountant, the general challenges, the COVID challenges. And I'll talk briefly about also the private sector accountant. And Lawrence, I'll talk about the interruption. interruption. Yes, please. Can you put it in, say, yeah. in presentation mode, slide mode? Oh, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry. Slide show. Okay. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? It's fine now. Yes, it is. It okay. Is. Start. So let's get back. I, as I was saying that. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about the introduction, accounting the public sector, challenges for the accountant. I'll talk about the general challenges, the COVID-19 challenges. I'll talk briefly about the private sector challenges. I'll talk about the way forward and I'll give the conclusion. I don't know, Z. I hope you, you are not the one moving my slides. <laughs> okay, so uh, to begin with is that, uh, all of you know that the Accountant General's Office was created by law. The first one, of course, was the Public Finance and Account uh, Public Finance uh, Act of 2003, and then the Public. Uh, it is also further highlighted in the Public Finance Management Act of 2015, and under Section 46 of that Public Finance Management Act. Accountant General's Office is generally a treasury support function responsible for the management and compilation of the accounts of government and will report to the PSST in line with the ministry's vision, mission, and mandate. I hope you all know that, of course, uh, Accountant General's Office is in the Ministry of Finance. And the, the overall vision for Ministry of Finance is a competitive economy for national development. The mission is to formulate sound economic policies, maximize revenue mobilization, ensure efficient allocation and accountability for public resources, so as to foster sustainable economic growth and development, 
and the mandate is to formulate policies that enhance stability and involvement. So those are the general for the Minister of Finance. But for the, uh, and of course, you know, the Minister of Finance mobilizes local and external financial resources for public expenditure and to regulate financial management and ensure efficiency in public expenditure and of course to oversee national planning and strategic development initiatives for economic growth. Now, specifically for the accountant general, is that uh, the mandate, oh, my dear. The, the vision of the accountant general's office is to promote high levels of accountability and transparency and the use of public resources in line with the ministry's vision. And of course, the mission as accountant general's office is to ensure safety and custody of public resources through high performing systems, policies, and professionalism that deliver value in public financial management. Uh, under, section, under section 46, as I had highlighted, the mandate, uh, mandates uh, under section 46 of the Public Finance Management Act 2015, the Accountant General's Office is a treasury support function responsible for provision of strategic direction on PFM matters relating to efficiency and effectiveness, utilization of public funds. And of course, we are also responsible for compilation and management of the accounts of government. We are responsible for custody and safety of public money. We are responsible for the resources of government. We are a custodian of all government certificates of title for investment. And we are required also to maintain uh, a register of all government investment. Now, the, our coverage is that uh, we cover uh, the public sector accounting covers uh, what we call ministries, departments and agencies. We cover local governments. Uh, we cover public corporations and state enterprises. And we, uh, we, we guide on accounting in the MDAs, of course, and uh, local government as gui guided by IPSAS, whereas public corporation and state enterprises use uh, IFRS, as you all know. Of course, there has always been a, an argument that do we actually do IPI, IPSAS, but that is something that I can discuss at another forum. We deal with over 340 votes, what we call votes, which are these are um, ministries, departments, and agencies, and local governments. And we have over 1,200 accounts and internal audit staff. Uh, and of course, this excludes the the local government uh, account, accounting staff that we, we also somehow deal with. Uh, and how do accountants or AGO deliver the treasury function? That is always the question that we, we really need to, 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 to discuss. That how does the accountants, all the accountant general's office deliver the treasury function? So we do that through various uh, various uh, uh, interventions. For example, we do, we are responsible for public finance management systems design and implementation. We, we are responsible for issuance of appropriate accounting standards uh, to votes. We are responsible for deployment of accountants across MDAs and actually procurement officer, although this was the center for accountants. We are responsible for management of government bank accounts. Uh, we are responsible for setting up internal control systems and policies for safety of public resources. We, we carry out what we call treasury ins inspection to enforce compliance. And we, we do a lot of training and capacity building for, for a cadre, not only the accounts cadre, but the cadre involved in public finance management. So this also includes people like PSAs who are accounting officers, includes departmental heads who are, who are the cost center controllers and so on and so, and so forth. We support the date 
management function. We have a full department for which is responsible for debt management. We, we do consolidation of government accounts. Uh, we do various change management sessions on PFM reforms across government and across cadres. And we do support uh, oversight committees of parliament uh, during the deliberation of uh, audit reports or any other reports that might be forwarded to them. And we prepare the treasury memoranda, which is the document that shows what action the government has, has taken after the parliament has discussed, after the oversight committees have discussed the Auditor General's report. Uh, what are the challenges? Now, if we go to the challenges for the accountant in the fiscal 20, the year 2020, 2021. Uh, of course, we have been having challenges that were there before the pandemic, but these challenges have been expounded with the onset of the, of, of the pandemic. In the face of these challenges, the international accounting principles and standards and the national legal and regulatory framework continue to apply. Because we, we said, we have always been saying that even though we have these challenges and especially of the COVID that we have, we have issued the guidelines to ensure that we still have to comply with the legal and regulatory framework. Uh, on this presentation, I'll bring, I'll just discuss about the non challenges of accountants usually grapple with and putting emphasis on the challenges that has been posed by the COVID pandemic. And then I will conclude on that. Uh, for those of you who keep reading, is that uh, there is a, a research, and this was done by Accounting Today Research and in the US. And it talks about that what keeps the accountants up at night. Why do accountants keep awake? And they talked about the top issues, the, the top issues that uh, keep the accountants awake were five. But of course, we, we shall see those that are specific to us. They talk about the, the impact of the technology. They talk about to change the shift to advisors. I hope what they used to do and what they do now is very completely different. They talk about, of course, that is for the US, especially the Tax Cuts and the Jobs Act that came with force uh, sometime back in 2017. And of course, the bigger one, and if, if you can see that it also happened to us recently, is the cyber security that we have to deal with. So if we go and look at if that can give us also some discussion points, is that uh, the first and foremost, the impact of new technology and ability to cope. Uh, as you know, new technology, such as artificial intelligence and data automation, provide opportunity for massive change in the accounting profession. And I think maybe let me also say this up front, and that uh, with the onset of uh, COVID, we realized that uh, we really needed to do things very differently. And we were a bit lucky in that for us, as a government, uh, the, for a long time, being thinking of engineering our business processes and automating, uh, automating, our, uh, automating our, our systems. And therefore, we were able to, to be able to, to solve most of the issues that were coming our way because we had already the systems that were in place. Uh, of course, uh, this in the public sector, uh, several reforms such as the IFMIS, the, PB, the PBS, the eCash, the e procurement, and the internal audit tools like teammates and Zova auditor management have been adopted to aid financial management. And we saw that this really were able to come in play during this pandemic that we had. Now, the challenge, of course, is the ability of accountants to learn the skills required to manage the machines or tools while they continue doing things the machines cannot yet do. 
that is the challenge that you have been having. And of course, the other challenge that you are seeing that with these automations, it gives us a lot of specialization. And this specialization has its own challenges that I can elaborate later uh, or on another forum. The other is, uh, of course, the public finance management reform, and that we have really been doing a lot of reforms. And these reforms have somehow taken a toll on, uh, or, or on their both human and financial resources. And um, uh, they are also heavy investment. Sometimes that we, we have difficulty in trying to, to justify uh, certain, uh, certain groups where they say, no, this is too much and so on and so on. But the reforms are not very cheap and the, the maintaining them is not as cheap either. So such reforms are spearheaded by accountants who have become most overstretched as a result. Okay. Uh, who have become overstretched as a result. The other aspect of course the challenge that we keep seeing are the staffing le levels or the, the people to have the skill set that we need for the current reforms that we are doing. And the, especially this, we are seeing it in the local governments where we have a, a lot of uh, staffing and skills set requirements lacking. And that is something that we need to do. To do. Uh, and we hope that we should do it sooner than later. But of course, the, the other challenge which remains in government is the the, the the remuneration of uh, a competitive remuneration for the staff that we have undertaking these reforms. Uh, uh, of course, the, the the other issue, of course, the bigger issue, as I say, is that the reforms uh, have uh, made us become very specialized, and this also brings into question the succession planning and so on, which is uh, there are certain skills that people have gained over time. And uh, once somebody retires or somebody goes to another place, that means that uh, we lose this kind of skills. And yet it also takes a long time for us to be able to, to, to make somebody up to, to gain those skills. But the bigger part that uh, all the, the most threat that we are seeing is the cyber security threat. Uh, of course, cyber threats are emerging at a high rate, which requires advanced tools and high-skilled IT personnel to mitigate the potential risks. Uh, for us, we have tried as much as possible to ensure that uh, we, we take cyber security as one of priority area that we handle. And we have been trying to train our staff in those areas of that cyber security. And we have been trying to acquire tools for those who are in the, in the government. They know what the security measures we have undertaken since we got the threat some time back. And the, since we got that threat and we enhanced our security, uh, I'm of course happy to say that we have not heard of any other incidents. And because the incidents that do happen, we detect them in time. But this is something that is very challenging that we continue to grapple with and we shall uh, grapple with it. It's expensive. That is something that we keep doing. Uh, of course, there is a more demand for more qualified accountants. That's the demand. But if the accountants, of course, are listening, is that we, we as qualified accountants must be able to give an output output of uh, uh, the output of a qualified person the output of a qualified first output of a qualified person because that is very important is that we cannot be qualified accountants and we are doing work of an accountant that is not qualified you find the people in the, you are head of accounts in, there are no reconciliation you cannot produce reports on time uh, you are doing an, an ESCO issues, you have unethical issues, so it becomes a bit of challenging on, on our side. 
So, but that is something that we, we, we shall keep trying to do. And for us, we encourage and we keep supporting uh, the development of staff. Uh, we also, as government, we, we have been using a cash basis of accounting, but we are trying as much as possible to lay the ground by doing the legal, looking at the legal environment and other, other considerations so that we transit and we, we transit from working on cash or modified cash to accrue accounting which, as you know, uh, has its uh, advantages. And we have been also trying to, to manage assets. That is an area that has been a bit of a, a problem, which we, we think we are going to handle. Now, of course, the general challenges, you have general challenges that have been there. Uh, and we, we've even before the pandemic, and which uh, we think uh, has also been the, something that we, we have not handled adequately and we, we want to start addressing them now. The first and foremost is the absence of a comprehensive asset management policy, which causes ambiguity in government ownership of valuable assets like land, equipment, motor vehicle, and building, ETC and, and ETC. So this is something that we are now working on and this process, once we have made a guideline on, policy, on asset policy, once we have handled the issues related to asset management, we should be able then to, to transit very smoothly to the accrual accounting. Of course, there is also an, the issue of laws, conflicting laws, especially between the local governments and the, and the center, uh, and the laws between the, the center amongst themselves, so you have various laws that set up certain parastatals and state enterprises, and this sometimes conflict with the, the cardinal law on public finance, which is the Public Finance Management Act of 2015. But this is something that we are trying to harmonize and see out on it. And of course, there is a, an issue that we, we have been grappling with, with politicians, is the issue of creating administrative units, which, which keeps stretching us uh, in terms of human resource, in terms of finances, and this slows, the, this slows down our implementation of PFM system. Now I come to the COVID pandemic specifically. You all know that on the 30th January 2020, World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus virus outbreak, a public health emergency. And in March 2020, the outbreak was declared a global pandemic. Uh, you all know that governments took measures to ensure safety of all Ugandans, while at the same time ensuring the river of, of service. Uh, you, you well know that the His Excellency, the President, issued directives on the various preventive measures to mitigate the spread of coronavirus. Uh, standard operating procedures were developed, which at the climax required the closure of most institutions like schools, public transport, airports, and borders. The SOPs required most of us to stay and operate from home, save for a few essential staff. Uh, of course, the restrictions now have been eased and the normal and the normal new and the new normal requires social distancing, no contacts, wearing masks, limited gatherings or meetings, restricted public transport, minimum staff, no travel abroad, etc. etc. Uh, the outbreak and ensuring measures to combat COVID have impacted on the daily uh, operations in nearly all sectors and has led to a widespread economic uncertainty and challenges to the accountants. Uh, how, how are these uh, manifested? How are these challenges? First and foremost, the remote working. Uh, people were uh, told that now you should be able to work at home if you are non-essential or if you are if you are non-essential, non even if you are essential, but if you can work at home, you work at home. But of course, this uh, took away 
the day to day or the, the, the contact or the day to day supervision, which has some challenges. And uh, of course, this presents an increased risk of fraud as internal controls may be bypassed as a result. Uh, the third was that uh, the unprecedented economic challenges, that uh, there are lessons that we learned from COVID as individuals, where you would find that you even didn't have uh, any resources to, to, to buy the, 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 the best essentials. So this, uh, of course, uh, is an incentive, creates a, an incentive for fraud by employees, and it, it prepares enhanced risk taking and unethical decision making. Uh, of course, the, the other is that we do not have specific uh, SOPs for online documentation. So do you, with our level of fraud and transactions, how do you handle a, a document that has been transmitted to you electronically by mail. Even others did not even have official mails. It should be personal mails. So how do you know that this is an authenticated mail and so on and so, and so forth? So consequently, there is a fear of accountability by staff taking action on documents submitted online. And this we saw that there was a delay in responding to certain document or taking certain action because uh, we had to do a validation process at which it had to take time. Uh, of course, the, the other is that uh, there was, uh, owing to the lockdown, routine inspection of votes has been very difficult and office largely relies on reports submitted by accounting officer or account, heads of accounts themselves, which has been challenging. But we also saw a very big challenge, especially we used to do to to do support for the local government is in submission of the end of year accounts, but this was not possible because of the circumstances where we didn't send staff to, to the sites to do the site support. Uh, of course, the communication between account and general's office and votes was constrained co coordination and communication because of the, this pandemic. In many circumstances, clients log in issues and they, they are not really available in the office to be supported. Uh, and some sites were not even able, because it is unfortunate, but some sites were not even able to do any log on because they do not have internet connectivity and so on and so forth. Uh, and unfortunately, again, I have to say that, that we are unable to do training and capacity building for the new CADA, the new or the transferred card uh, because of uh, this COVID. Uh, unfortunately, also again, is that we are seeing that the, the, the cost of internet connectivity and some entities do not even have internet in their premises. Uh, and this was a, several sites have challenges with the rising costs of internet for which they have no budgets. And on the other hand, many sites have unstable or intermittent internet, especially local governments. This is something, of course, for us, we are trying also to address by working in ITAU to ensure that the national backbone is completed as soon as possible. Now, of course, as accountants, there is something also that will interest you, especially for those in the private sector, uh, is the going concern the going concern issues. You know that governments under normal circumstances are expected to operate in perpetuity. The determination of whether the going concern assumption is appropriate has been relevant for individual government organization. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused serious concern in terms of locked down businesses. Of course, you know, for example, the Uganda Airlines was not able to operate for some time reduced ability to provide goods and services, difficulty in collecting revenue from taxpayers, increase in government provision for economic stimulus, and uncertainty over future receipts of government and other types of funding for some public entities. While this may not cause, pose a going concern threat, a more robust assessment of going concern may need to be performed for all public sector entities, but that may not have been done in the past. 
uh, in the case of Uganda, uh, economic impacts of COVID pandemic is not a subsequent event. Instead, there may be a recognition and measurement adjustment needed to various items in the financial statements to reflect the impact of the pandemic. And this is, of course, applies to mostly to uh, those in the in the private sector or those parastatals that use IFRS. For us, of course, as government is the that we we uh, an accounting basis is that these adjustments we see where we had to do a lot of uh, reallocations within the budget, where we had to freeze certain items to be able to cater for others, and so on and so forth. Uh, the the other issue of course which might need to to look at is uh, the issue of impairment and as i said that this still relates to those who do or uh, uh, full, full accrual and if uh, ifrs uh you, you have to do look at the impairment of financial statement uh, due to the impact of covid investment sold by government may have incurred lost in value the timing of when this that loss is in value is recognized required requires in-depth analysis in line with the IPSA for investment measured at fair value, e.g. investments in its instrument, what in active market, a loss in value is recognized immediately. So those are some aspects of uh, issues that are in, uh, in the accounting guidelines or uh, the various reporting framework that you as accountants might need to look at. Now, of course, the, there is also a challenge uh, to the private sector in that um, uh, the, the private sector, how are, they, uh, how are they handling this or what are the consequences or challenges of this pandemic? The first one I can talk about, I'll talk about very few of them, is issues of bankruptcy because there are some, uh, or some more trading that will be go bankrupt uh, and the, the accountants within the private sector will need to see how best they can deal with these bankruptcy issues. The other is of course financial advisory services to clients that he, it's needed more than ever to do a financial ad, to advise the clients on how they move given the circumstances that, that we are in. Of course they might also have need for re revaluation or re assessment of portfolios. We see that have loans which have the to do loan rescheduling, loan renegotiations, and so on. And it might also, some organization might also go into downsizing. And also what is important is that the, now you might rely not necessarily on the physical visit, but on, on um, e, 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 e documentation and so on. This may lead to falsification of accounts which the private accountants or even the public accountants must take, a, uh, take note of and see how best to handle uh, this. So these are challenges that uh, really need, they are practicing accountants need to, to think through and see how best uh, to handle them. But of course, uh, all is not lost, is that there are opportunities that are seen, uh, have come with this, and there are lessons that we have learned, although I've not enumerated them in my presentation, but for us, there are so many things that we have learned with this COVID pandemic, and there are, there are ways that we have now thought of how to do things much more differently than we are doing. And opportunities are there for the private or practicing accountants, because what we have seen is that uh, there is more collaborations for more than ever, that we are seeing that uh, the foreign foreign firms are requesting where they cannot do a certain the assessment of a certain project so they have been uh, contacting us to, to advise them which uh, which which audit firm or which firm can be able to handle that on their behalf so these opportunities out there but uh, we have also learned a lesson in that we must be to the large extent be self-reliant it's very very important is that once there was a shutdown. If you have uh, systems that are rely, you are relying on foreign foreigners. There is a bit of a challenge there. 
Now, what is the way forward? Of course, the way forward is a continuous training and capacity building. This has always been uh, our, our, our belief. And we know that technology is expected to change continuously and accountants are urged to embrace it as an opportunity. For us in government, we continue training and conducting change management session as a way of empowering our cadre. But uh, it is up to the cadre, those especially on the forum, to ensure that you also better yourself and take up these opportunities that we give you to be able to, uh, to better yourself and uh, so that you, your skill sets uh, are, need, are the ones that we need within the, the public sector. Currently, we are using online to technology to be able to deliver our change management and capacity building programs. And uh, we hope that this will continue. And this is something we are, that we had even piloted before the, the, the outbreak of the pandemic. We have online tools for, for, for training and the uh, aid things like videos, self uh, learning videos, etc, etc. The, the second, of course, we have seen is to develop appropriate policies and guidelines. Uh, policies like the asset management policy to be pursued, provide a suitable legal environment for fair reporting. There is a need for COVID working policy, protect workers from inf infection and employee employer liability, which should, should include uh, standard operating procedures for working offsite, online communication, the alignment of formation measurements for staff and the client engagement, both on and offsite. We, there is a need to have a clear performance monitoring and accountability mechanism. And need, they need to be strengthened to ensure that there is productivity of offsite. Uh, we, at times, uh, you know, we are used to being to, for our supervisors to see us. And if the supervisor is not seeing you, then you don't sit and work as you are supposed to do. So this working at home is that it might tend to compromise the, the productivity of an employee. So this is something that we need to look at and see how to guide. Of course, we need the Minister of ICT to prepare and saturate guidelines regarding electronic submission of documents in line with the national information and communication technology policy of 2014 and the Electronic Signatures Act. Of course, they are already there, but I think we need to re-emphasize and see how to, to, to guide uh, the, the people on how to do it. But what is also most important is that we need to retool the staff. Uh, we need to equip staff with necessary tools such as laptops, and internet, internet data to facilitate working from home. There is a need for flexibility and adaptability. There has been increased flexibility to modify and adapt offsite and remote support to our clients without diluting quality of service. For example, running of key performance indicators and resolution with the users at the site, creation of super user groups to ease communication and resolution of issues. For us, this is something that we have been doing before and we continue doing, and maybe now we have to emphasize it. Uh, of course, there is a need to maintain and strengthen coordination with the ministries and agencies and local government, internal departments and directorate. Uh, we need, of course, to also explore alternative sources of funding because the funding we saw at during this, uh, during this uh, COVID, is that the, the funding sources were largely, largely affected. And we think that it's higher time that we, we look at the alternative of sources of funding, that the, as a ministry, we are putting a resource mobilization strategy. I think now it is high time that for us as a ministry to look at that much, first, um, much more in detail and be able to see how then we can implement it or expound it. Uh, we need to focus on rebuilding revenue to, to emerge stronger. That is something the His Excellency has, 
has told us that uh, we did not fold our hands. So we should look at this as an opportunity to see how best we can, for example, think of uh, import substitution, think of self-reliance, and how do we do it, and so on and so forth. But of course, uh, as a, for us as accountants, you should just know that adopting to remote work now is going to become normal. So this will change the workplace safety measure and requirement. We'll be reconfiguring our work sites to promote the physical, physical distancing for if you have followed the SOPs. Then, of course, there is a guideline on how many you can have in the, at, a, at a goal. So those are things that we, we are really looking at and how seeing how to even an overview and I would appreciate if now we could have a discussion, any questions so that I can be able to, to answer. I thank you very much and I'm hoping that I have given you something to think through and be able to discuss. I thank you. Sorry, I was seeing people saying I should put on the, the video, but uh, I thought uh, I'll be more, more audible without, without it, but it's okay. I can now be seen if we need to see me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, AG. Thank you for that um, uh, elaborate and well-researched uh, an insightful presentation. Um, uh, through your presentation, you have uh, touched on, on the, the work of, of the Accountant General's Office um, and, and accounting broadly in the public sector, and also addressed the various challenges uh, for accountants, the general challenges, uh, but the specific challenges as well um, brought about by COVID-19. And, and you also went further to address challenges that the private sector accountant um, uh, is likely to deal with uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, and finally, you have taken us through um, your insights on the way forward uh, for, 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 for the accounting uh, fraternity as, as we deal through, as we work through these uh, challenging times. So thank you very much for, um, for, for, you know, for your for your thoughts on this subject and, and for sharing all of your your knowledge and and and, and consideration of, of of you know the broader issues uh, within this presentation. There are some questions here that um, I'm going to um, read out for you uh, so that you can try and address them. Uh, the first question is from CPA Uthman Mayanja, uh, uh, and he thanks you very much for a good presentation. Uh, he says that it's been a, a long wait for the implementation of IPSAS in a period where so many reforms have been made. Uh, and his question is, what more needs to be done to speed this up? Uh, and how can accountants help? Uh, and, and perhaps related to his question, I, I would add, uh, is that has the pandemic uh, again, uh, thinking from, from your position as the Accountant General, has the pandemic had uh, an impact on, on your implementation roadmap uh, for, uh, for, for accrual accounting in, in government? Uh, maybe we'll start with that question. I, I could perhaps give you a question at a time if, if that's what you prefer. Uh, sorry, AG, I, I think you're, you're muted. I've unmuted. So yes. that is a very good question, and it has always been coming up. Is that we we have been very slow on um, on implementing IPSAS. Uh, that it that is true. It's not that we are being very slow. Is that we are trying to ensure that we we have adequate. We have addressed all the prerequisites before we we dash into that. And so that is something that we are looking at. Uh, and as I had told you, is that uh, for us, we are looking at moving to, a, to IPSAS and fully accrual uh, IPSAS uh, by doing three things, three main things that we are looking at. As I said, we are looking at the, now the assets, that how do we first of all report comprehensively on the assets. 
that's why we are developing the policies, the guidelines on how to, to handle the assets. The second we are looking at is that how do we have adequate staff to implement this? And that is something that I've, I've, I've talked about even earlier, that at the center we are trying to see that there is a, a, a great improvement, that one I have to say. And I have always to thank my staff that uh, we, we now have uh, the qualified staff that we have. But at the local government, it's something that is very challenging. And it is compounded by the fact, and this is something that you have been discussing within government, it's compounded by the fact that we do not have control of the finance card or the accounts card within the local government. And therefore, their development path is a bit of a challenge to us. Although we give them initiatives to ensure that they, they, they do the training, but we do not have full, full control on them. And of course, the, the recruitment that is done by the, very, the, the, the district service commission is not within our control, it's not at the center. And that is something that is of a bit of challenging, but that is something that we are working on to ensure that we, we can then address uh, uh, how we move to, to IPSA. So the staffing gap is a bit of a problem, but not only that, but training and retaining the good staff. Because that means that we have to do certain reform, pay, pay reforms. We have to do, give a good working environment to be able to retain these workers and so on. But that's something that we are still grappling with and we hope that should be able to be solved as we move into full IPSA. So the other, of course, we are looking at is at the legal and the regulatory framework. We keep looking at that, keep changing here and there. And this is something that uh, takes time. So the IPSAS, I, I know we have always been blamed that, uh, that, that we are slow, but we think that it's better to be slow and sure other than rush when you are not sure. The second was on the issue of the pandemic as well. Mark, you might remind me. The second part of the question? Yes, it was related, uh, 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 asking about the, the impact of the pandemic on your uh, roadmap for implementation, whether uh, you know, the timelines have had to change as a result. Roadmap, yes, on the issue of the roadmap. For, for sure, the, the pandemic caused some bit of a problem because we the roadmap we are working on uh, we had, in some fora, we had said we have developed the roadmap where we are setting up a project, where we are looking for financing to start up the project. So definitely the pandemic brought us some bit of issue. And the, and the accountant general's office I also want to emphasize is that we have so many reforms. So we keep sequencing. Now, if you are out there, what would you do first? Would you do the IPSAS reporting or would you do reforms within the procurement cycle that is now a not cry? So that is the, the dilemma that sometimes we are faced to it. So now the pandemic was supposed to concentrate and complete the implementation of EGP, the e-government procurement, uh, procurement, but this was not, was not able because of the pandemic that came in and uh, we had to do some readjustment. So now that means that uh, it has affected us in that we have now to take more time on implementing this EGP. At the same time, we are also thinking about moving to, to implementation of pro and asset management. So those are the, the challenges and the trade-offs that sometimes we have to, to make and which uh, also affects the, our, our speed on implementing it. Sir. Yes. The other, Mark, the other question, this was one, the other two? Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, AG. The, the second question is, or the third question now is from CPA Agri Makanti. Uh, he is asking you to provide some comment on the impact of COVID-19 on public debt. Uh, in government. Okay. Uh, I I hope those who I I had that discussion when we were I was discussing on SCA forum sometime last month. 
So it definitely it has caused an impact because uh, what we have seen is that we have seen a, a drop within the, the revenue collection. And of course, as you know, government, the sources of tax are the normal revenue, the sources of income that we use for uh, to support our budget is the normal tax collections that we do, is the, the foreign funding, which comes in form of grants, and the, sometimes the loans, concessional loans, and then of course the domestic uh, borrowing that we do. Now, if there is, according to the plan, if there is a shortfall in one of those, then that means we have to see how best we have to, to get that funding gap. And unfortunately, the easiest way for us to raise the funds is to go on the domestic market and borrow domestically. This has been, this for sure affects us so much and it has affected us so badly. Uh, they, I think we shall come out with our debt reports soon. You will see how we have moved and the, we are, it is even getting worse in this financial year because the, the effects are now being given felt more within this financial year that we are undertaking, the 2020-2021. So that is something that really, it will have an effect on our debt levels. Uh, of course, you also, you also know that when government goes to borrow from the domestic market, it has an effect on the private sector borrowing and the interest rates and so on and so forth. So for sure, the pandemic has, great, has had a great impact on the debt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, AG. Uh, there's a, there's a follow-up question from uh, CPO Utman, and uh, he states, as a taxpayer, I'm, I'm appalled by the direction of uh, the cost of public administration. What is the role of the accountant general in fostering fiscal discipline? Are there any targets that have been set up? That is the other one, of course, when the mix <laughs> <laughs> politics with it. for us we advise and we can only advise that is for sure but for sure what we have said and we continue saying that the the cost of public administration is too high and it is high time we as government really rethink of uh, this public administration of course uh, i think some of you have heard is that uh, next uh, next uh, year that is 21-22 we are moving into what we call program based uh, budgeting but of course even if we go that way to be able to because they are saying no we keep spending money spending money we, but we don't see outcomes but as long as that we also even if we go that way without trying to see to realign is that then still we still have a problem administrative units and administrative costs are too high and unfortunately for us as accountant general's office or minister of finance, we can only comment and say, no, this is not possible. I think that is my response. Mark, you are still there? <laughs> yes. Mark, are you still there or are you uh, done? I, I, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, sorry, I think there was a, a connection problem. Uh, mm. CPA Godfrey says, I would like you to share with the participants um, uh, uh, some perspectives or highlights on the most recent uh, public uh, PFM reforms uh, in government, uh, the, the key reforms that you can I'll start on um, very briefly. Okay, so the the key reforms, of course, as I said, of course, briefly to, to talk about the reforms and PFM reforms in the government, we handle these reforms in the uh, under three broad, broad categories: the legal and the regulatory framework, uh, the systems, the, the lying systems and then uh, procedures and systems and of course on the human resource which is capacity building and so on now the we as a accountant general's office 
Oh, we, you had so in one of the slides where I was talking about what we are responsible for is uh, implementing PFMs, uh, designing and implementing of PFM reforms. Now, the current ones that we have been doing, or the current ones that we are handling, is that we are working on what we call the EGP. Uh, this is, we want to re engineer the procurement process. Now, this procurement process, there has been, a, of course, the, an issue where people are complaining that the timelines are, uh, are hindrance to the to procurement, that the law has issues, and so on and so forth. So we are looking at the law. As you know, we have an, a PPD amendment before parliament. It had been uh, passed, but uh, there were some uh, clause, there are some sections that we are not happy with. Well, there are some sections that were not coming out clearly as we had wanted. So it was returned back to Parliament, and I hope that he, very soon it should be able to, to come out. The other area we are addressing is the issue in procurement, is the issue of the systems, trying to re-engineer the, the procurement process. So we are trying to, especially by automating, so that we try to minimize the the human to human interaction within the procurement process. Now, uh, was, uh, suppose we are doing a pilot, and the, of course, the, the, the COVID pandemic gave us an opportunity. We had uh, contracted uh, a supplier from Greece to be able to deploy for us a solution on e procurement. But uh, the pandemic, first of all, it, the person couldn't be available with us here. And therefore, there were so many issues that were arising out of the solution that we had, been, that we had hoped to take on. And we, we thought wise that it would, be, it would be very risky for us to continue under that mode. So we had to change the strategy and we adopted a locally uh, grown solution, which we are now implementing. So we are hoping that this should be able to, we should be able to finish this in piloting by December and by January, we should start bringing most of the entities on board. And we hope that we should be able to complete by the financial year 2022, 2023, uh, all the entities, including local government. So that the procurement, we don't want to hear these things of issues that the the procurement units have removed the certain documents to favor one, sir, one supply against the another, etc, etc. So that one we are working on that. The next reform we are undertaking, as I said, is the issue, area of asset management, where we are working on asset policy, asset guidelines. We have an asset automated module on the integrated financial management. So we are trying to populate that and guiding accounting office and votes on how to handle those assets. The other, of course, you have been implementing, as you know, is an issue of the integrated financial management system that continues. And we hope that we should be, as I said, the problem is that you keep uh, increasing administrative units and therefore it keeps giving us moving targets. Because by now, if we are in the original, if we had been from the original numbers, by now we should have included completed the, the, the full implementation and rollout of the integrated financial management system. But also on, on that is that the, there's something that we, we often forget is that when we have these systems, we have to keep maintaining. So we maintain those systems and we keep maintaining uh, issues of uh, addressing issues of security, issues of uh, staffing, issues of re-engineering the process, etc, etc. The other area that we are, we are looking at in reforming is in the budgeting process. As I told you, that the government wants to move from the sector-based approach to the program approach. And that means reconfiguring and changing of all the PFM systems, which we are, we are working on. And we hope that we should also be able to, to complete that by the beginning of the next financial year. I guess those are the few, if I can talk about.
Thank you very much, AG. Uh, certainly, it looks like there's a lot of work and, and uh, projects, reform projects ongoing at, at, uh, at, a, at the Accountant General's Office and, and in government uh, broadly. Uh, so thank you for that response. The, 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 the question, the next question is, um, and there are two related questions, so I'm going to, to merge them. So the, you, you earlier discussed uh, the issue of capacity uh, in local government uh, human resource capacity in local government. Uh, you highlighted uh, some challenges in that area. So the question is, uh, what is the plan to address the capacity gaps in, in local government in terms of capacity building, training, uh, to enable them uh, be able to deliver on the reforms and, and ultimately also implement accrual accounting as, as, you, as you mentioned. Okay, so thank you very much for that question. What we are doing is that we are working with the Ministry of Local Government, and actually uh, some other development partners have also come on board. We are going to develop a strategy and the, the issues that some of them that I talked about on the issues of recruitment and the retention, which is very important, is that uh, I've seen very various uh, staff in the, in the local governments who want to cross and come to the ministries rather than staying in the local governments because they think that the working environment in the local government is not conducive uh is that uh, they, they are they are not protected at times for example somebody in the in the capture a local government whatever it, it's, it is is once you you don't do certain things then the districts can even throw you out of the of the job and so on and so forth. So those are the, the things that we really want to look at. So we are working with the Ministry of Local Government to, to see how best to help. Uh, but of course the challenge that has been there, uh, are the funding, which is something that we, we are trying to see how best to resolve. So we, again, I can say it is something that is challenging, but we are trying to work with local governments to ensure that the Ministry of Local Government to see what strategy we can come with and see how to help the local governments. But of course, as government, I still insist that the biggest challenge is for you to be able to train that person and be able to retain the person. And retaining the person, you have to give a conducive working environment, not only the Saturday, but the other, uh, other things that go with the working environment. Thank you, AG. Uh, the next question is from uh, someone anonymous, but his question is, uh, it appears that government has not made good use of capital markets in Uganda to raise medium uh, and long-term finance to support the development budget. Uh, what, what, what is the problem and, and how can it be addressed? That is a very good observation, and that is something also we have realized that the Minister of Finance uh, and there are reforms. I don't know if the capital markets people are here. There are reforms which are being undertaken at the capital market authority. So I, that is something, and that is true. That what the 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 person is asking is correct. It's true, and something that we have also seen ourselves and trying to see how best to to solve that. So I don't know if there's anyone on capital markets should be able to share with you, but I know there are reforms that are being undertaken on the capital markets, and we hope that should be developed sooner than later. Okay. Thank you, thank you, AG. There's another question here from uh, CPA Tom Paji. Um, I, I think we will we'll probably take the next 15 minutes or so that we end by about 11.30. So his question from um, CPA Tom Paji is um, he's asking you as the person responsible for government treasury, uh, uh, what your thoughts are on how government could provide funding to support uh, businesses, especially those uh, with uh, official loans. He's thinking, for example, that government could have worked with banks to waive uh, a third of the loan interest 
government paying uh, a third of the interest and business paying a third of that interest, especially during the lockdown period, um, and also how to support other businesses such as schools and the night businesses that still can't operate up to now. Um, so I, I guess he's broadly asking your thoughts on uh, on uh, support to, to business, uh, uh, fiscal intervention by government and the like. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, thanks for that uh, question and observation. I think it's very para, it's very uh, a good question at this point in time. But uh, again, as I, I think the, the Minister of Finance and the Governor has been, uh, have been in, on the various media saying that there are certain things which are a bit of a trade-off in that uh, we as a country, we are not uh, at a certain level to be able to, for example, be able to pay for everybody's loan or be able to 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 give free grants and so on and so forth but what we can do is to attempt and that attempt is there is that we have tried to to give funding to udb so that if you you are viable you can go and they give you at the concessional rates so that you can then do your business they have been for those in the tourism sector you have seen where the eu has given a grant to be able to revive because of the tourism sector was one that was badly hit so if you fulfill certain conditions there are grants that can be given to you uh we the governor is the other time where i said that the, the banks can do a shouldering of loans and the renegotiation uh this uh, they have at least advised the, the banks to do that but it is of course to be difficult for for governments to ensure that they they pay off for example loans is that uh we are not at that not yet at that level to be able to to undertake such kind of action but those are the actions that we have done for us also government again is that we have ensured that we pay uh, the suppliers that we owe uh, on time and you can see that in this uh, we had to squeeze in this quarter to ensure that we put adequate funding for all the suppliers that they had supplied and are not paid so that they are paid and their business can continue but paying off or writing off that is something that is a bit of a challenge and the, something that might not be very practical at this time so that's what we as government are doing to try and stimulate and the, the other which the is excellence is very passionate about is on the input substitution is that if you have uh you are engaged in a, a business or man, uh, for example manufacturing items that we are currently importing or items that are now related to health uh, health which support us in the minim minimizing covid and so on they give you certain uh, incentives tax holidays and so on and so forth so that's what you can do to that extent but the other is the other might be very difficult for us to undertake thank you for your, your comments and thoughts on that issue um the, 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 there's another question here and and it's um it's from cpa cheetah chambade mm -hmm. so the sustainability and, and climate action or climate change is now a, a, a big a big uh, concern to everyone across the globe so his question is uh he's aware that government government institutions do a lot of procurement uh, but he would like to know what measures are being put in place to ensure uh, a sustainable public procurement as part of these, uh, this procurement process and the reforms that you are now undertaking in that space? Okay, that is a very good question once again. This, that is also one of the reform maybe I did not talk about, is that uh, we are looking about sustainable procurement. And we have currently undertaken what we call the national procurement policy. And it's very clear in that I think next time you request me to come with my commissioner for procurement so that we give what various the various interventions that we are we are working on to ensure uh, sustainable procurement. 
So that's a very good question. And as I said, we have a literature, we have a foreign policy, we are developing the guidelines on the sustainable procurement. Uh, and that is something that uh, we are working on is for sure. We think that uh, that is very important and it's now worldwide to, to be able to ensure that the procurements are sustainable and not only promote the are sustainable, but they should also promote environment protection. Uh, they must have equality, all those kind of things. And that is also part of the things that we are put in the new law. So uh, we, the gentleman can get some literature from my office if he needs to. Uh, thank you, Eji. I think we, we certainly have a topic for the next uh, for the next session when uh, we may engage That's with the to get to. Thank you, um, Eji. The next question is on skills. So um, you, you you within your presentation you addressed the impact of COVID and 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 provided some perspectives on the on the way forward. So um, from where you sit. What do you see as the skills that uh, the public sector accountant needs to develop to, to provide the value that you're going to require um, in, in the post-COVID uh, environment uh, in government with all the necessary changes that might have to come? Uh, what, are, what are those skills that we, you think uh, an accountant working in government uh, should be trying to develop? Uh, what areas of, uh, I think you call it retooling and capacity building should they be trying to address uh, right now to be more relevant to you uh, going forward? Okay, that is again a good question and the, I think that's something I was also maybe next time I'll talk about. Now for us what we are saying, uh, and uh, that is why for those who, who are in public, at our um, office at account and general you know, know that that's why we are trying to look at the, the the schemes of service because in the old days you used to say i need somebody with bcom accounting i do all those kind of things but uh, when you look at what we currently do is far more than accounting we need the skills in it we need the skills in the training we did the skills in the policy, we need skill, all those kind of things. And as I said, for us, we have a whole department that deals with capacity building, uh, training and capacity building. And the, the other, what I keep telling the accountants is that the, the traditional accounts that we used to do are now no more. We, we have certain skills, you need to do new IT skills, for example, I have now people in my office here who are basically on IT. So, and that is something that you as an accountant, you need to look at. But um, to again re-emphasize is that for us, we do tailor-made skilling of our staff. And it's very important that the, 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 when we call upon you to give you those skills, be keen to ensure that you, you take on those skills. Because the, it's not enough to just have, I have ACCA, I have CPA, it's not enough anymore because now, as I said, you know, we are doing, we are using virtual online. So you need to know that. And those are, and especially the reforms even now that we do, if you, you look at the reforms that we are doing, basically you might not, you need a multi skilled person, a person who has not, knows a bit of law, knows IT, knows a bit of human resource and all those kind of things. So those are things that we really, Need. And we, we at the Ministry of Finance, we, we are very good at, at uh, enhancing people's skills. So we, we take training very seriously and we, we really provide funding for training. Uh, except the other thing that we have seen in public sector is that people misunderstand training to mean only going abroad, but you can still train on your desk. Now the COVID has, has shown us that you must be on your desk rather than traveling. So, that is something that we need to think through or now we deliver those training, but for us, we are committed to ensure that we skill our staff, the accountants, and it's not only in the accounts, but in the other areas and other reforms that we undertake. We are now, as I said, you heard, I was talking about, we are implementing the e-procurement. 
and it's only not the procurement card that are leading this, the accountant. So if for you, you say, no, me, I'm an accountant, I can't do procurement, then it becomes a bit of a challenge on your side. Thank you. Thank you very much, AG. I, I think we have exhausted all the questions that uh, the participants have posted here. Um, we thank you very much for uh, sparing your very valuable time in, in these very challenging times. I'm sure there's a lot of demand for your attention in the office and, and in various other areas and fora. We thank you for putting aside time to uh, engage with uh, uh, your, your fellow CPAs and, and share your, your thoughts and perspectives on COVID-19 and its impact on the public sector counter. Uh, we, we hope that uh, whenever we call on you, you uh, make time and, uh, and spare uh, some uh, time to, 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 to again engage with us and, and speak at, at, at such future events. So on behalf of the Institute, I want to thank you very much uh, for uh, your time this morning. Uh, we are heading towards the close of this uh, session and uh, we look forward to engaging with you in the future. And uh, if any questions come up uh, during um, uh, within the discussion or by follow-up emails, uh, we will share those with you and and and, and share back uh, the feedback to uh, to the participants. Uh, attendees, participants, uh, fellow CPAs, thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, there are a couple of other webinars coming up, as you see on your screen. There is an NGO webinar on uh, Friday, 16th October, and there will be another webinar on the 21st of October on Islamic banking and finance. Uh, I, I hope that you know how to register uh, to attend this event. Uh, you simply go to our website and, uh, and follow the link to each of those webinars, register to participate, and you should be able to, to, to do so as, as you've done today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, attending and actively participating for your questions and, and comments throughout uh, this session. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the session. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions after this, you